Please be seated. Good afternoon. I'm Chris McLeod, Dean of St Peter's Cathedral, a national Aboriginal Bishop for the Anglican Church of Australia. On behalf of the Cathedral, and Archbishop Geoffrey Smith, Archbishop of Adelaide and Primate of the Anglican Church of Australia. I welcome you to this celebration of the life of Dr. Luicia O'Donoghue. I acknowledge this afternoon the presence of His Excellency General, the Honourable David Hurley, AC, Governor General, and Her Excellency Mrs Hurley. Her Excellency, the Honourable Francis Adamson, AC, Governor of South Australia, and Mr Rod Bunton. The Honourable Peter Malinowskis, Premier of South Australia. The Honourable Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister of Australia. And many other distinguished guests. St Peter's Cathedral resides on the lands of the Gauna people. We give thanks for their ancestors and acknowledge the ongoing right and responsibility of the elders to care for this country. We are committed to work and pray towards a more just settlement for all First Nations people. We pay our respects. First Nations peoples who are with us today. I welcome Uncle Moogie. I now invite Jakira Telfer to give a greeting to Spirit of Place. Namani, Nyanya de Jikiru Wario, Malawar Takitinanyai, Nyai Chili, Ninko Murndi Kumanka, in Burundi, Ninko Ninyadli Yarta, Bukiana Medawanda Ninyai Takiti, 
Tavala, Mena, Yarta, Tandawuma, Munancha. My name is Jakira Taufa. I come from the Dry Forest clan of the Ghana people of the Adelaide region. And I greet you to the spirit of this place, Tandawuma, sacred ground, the dreaming place of the red kangaroo. What I said in language was acknowledging the ancient that still lay sleeping here, but also the culture that still lives through us. I also acknowledge the four directions that you have come from to be here today. And I'd like to pay my respects to the family, Deb, Amy, Paul, and her close family circle. I stand here as a young, proud Aboriginal woman of culture on International Women's Day. I am the carrier of culture, ceremony and spirit for my people, my family and my community. Something that Ani Locha believed in. Something that Ani Locha fought for. And I just want to... <clears throat> I want to thank her for believing in us. Believing in us young people. Believing in her people her community, and I want to thank her for everything she did for not only us, but this nation. And for those who knew Loacha, knew that she was the owl. In her mother's language, young Kondjara, the owl is Jurki. For those who know the story about the owl, that's wisdom. And the owl we don't always know when it's coming. The owl flies silent. But when it's there, we know. And when it's there, it's needed. And our nation needed her. Um, in my language, Jorka Lurka Yurkani Yaichandi, that means the travelling wisdom of the owl. And I think that speaks to what she lived by. She travelled for her people, her family, and her community, those three. I'm honoured to be here and to be invited. And I'll now share the breath of the ochre in a circle. A circle that was carved by her and the legacy that will live on. Ma. For the order of service, we say together the words in bold print and we sing the hymns together. Grace and peace from the Lord be with you. We have come together to thank God for the life of Luigi O'Donoghue to celebrate a life well lived, to mourn and honour her, to entrust her to the loving mercy of God, and to deal reverently with her mortal body, to support her family and friends in their grief, to give expression to our own and then to continue in our life's journey. As we do so, 
we face the certainty of our own death. And the question of how we are to live before God and others. Yet we believe that those who share Christ's life in joy and in suffering and who show the marks of Christ's life share eternal life with him. Therefore we turn in faith and hope to God who created and sustains us all. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in, in, in me, even though they die, yet will they live. Let us say the opening prayer together. Loving God, you alone are the source of life. May your life-giving spirit flow through us. Fill us with compassion one for another. In our sorrow, give us the calm of your peace. Kindle our hope and let our grief give way to joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and also give my respect to the many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us here today. It is a great and humbling honour to join with you today to honour the memory of one of the most remarkable leaders this country has ever known. The Widger O'Donoghue was, to use the words of Noel Pearson, a leader's leader. As we mourn her, we give thanks for the better Australia that she helped to make possible. Perhaps even more importantly, we reflect on the possibility of an even better Australia which she placed so clearly before us. Last year, when I had the honour of delivering the Lewidja O'Donoghue oration here in Adelaide, I said I saw her as one of the great rocks around which the river bend of our history is gently bent, persuaded to flow along a better course. Her remarkable power was one built on an abiding faith in the possibility of a more united Australia. This was a faith she embodied with her efforts to bring about meaningful and lasting reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. A faith un underpinned by her unceasing work to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Yet consider the stony ground in which this faith somehow took hold. Starting with a childhood that saw her separated from her family, her language and even her own name, Dr O'Donoghue endured discrimination that would have given her every reason to lose faith in her country. But she never did. The little girl who longed to be reunited with her mother somehow transcended the weight of her own experience and grew into a woman of grace, 
moral clarity and profound inner strength. A woman who grew up in hard country, yet emerged as a figure of such generosity. We celebrate Dr. O'Donoghue's life of compassion, her life of courage, a life in which toughness and tenderness existed in perfect symbiosis. Hers was also a life that could be measured in firsts. She was the first Aboriginal trainee nurse at Royal Adelaide Hospital, the first woman to be a regional director of an Aboriginal federal department, the founding chairperson of the National Aboriginal Conference, the first Aboriginal woman to be made a member of the Order of Australia, the inaugural chairperson of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, and in 1992, at the launch of the International Year of the World's Indigenous People, she became the first Aboriginal person to speak at the United Nations General Assembly. Standing alongside Torres Strait Islander George Mai, she spoke of survival and she spoke of challenge. We have become, she said, marginalised in our own country. Yet, showing the mutually reinforcing strength and grace that were such defining features of her character, Dr O'Donoghue spoke of celebrating her people's survival, a celebration that entailed looking, to quote Dr O'Donoghue, with hope to our future. As she put it, we do not wish to conquer or oppress, nor indeed do we wish to retaliate for two centuries of injustice. Rather, we seek to create a new partnership based upon understanding, cooperation and goodwill. The past cannot be changed. The future is in our hands. And as the world watched on, she stood at the forefront of a new relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia an opportunity extended to all of us to accept and celebrate the world's oldest continuous living culture as a fundamental part of who we are as a nation. It is a journey we are still on, building on every moment of hard-won progress. It isn't a journey we travel in a straight line. But with every step forward, we remember it was so often Dr O'Donoghue, who led the way. She was proud of being first, but she was determined to not be the last. When Dr O'Donoghue opened a door, she held it open for all who followed. She made history, but her focus was on giving people a future. She wanted to be the first of many. In the words of her biographer, Stuart Rintoul, I asked her why she had lived the life she lived. She looked at me and said, because I loved my people. Through her time in this world, Dr. O'Donoghue walked tall and the power of her example made us all walk that little bit taller as well. Now she walks in another place. Yet, thanks to all that she did, she will always be here in all her warmth and all her strength, a great rock standing forever at the river's bend. May she rest in peace.
acknowledge the Ghana people and, our, and, and on behalf of us all, pay our respects to them as traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. Thank you all for coming here to remember Dr. O'Donoghue and celebrate her life and honour her and her considerable achievements, of which there are many, as you all know. My name is Pat Anderson, and I'm an Alyara woman from the Northern Territory. I am deeply honoured to have been asked by her family to address you today. My first words then are to the O'Donoghue family. It is always a time of sadness to say goodbye to, dear relative, to a dear relative who has passed. But I hope her family can take comfort from the love and respect that Dr. O'Donoghue inspired in all who met her throughout her long life. Dr. O'Donoghue and I worked closely for many years. It started when she helped us, a group of us, set up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research Institute that bears her name the Lowerter Institute, Australia's first Aboriginal-controlled, managed and led research institute where we set the research agenda. Dr O'Donoghue played a pivotal role here, as, she did some, as, she, as some other people did as well, including Marcy Langton, who's here, and I don't know, uh, Professor Marcy Langton, excuse me, and Professor Ian Anderson, to name a couple. It took almost 23 years to get the Lowerture Institute established and running as it does today, today. These years were turbulent and very difficult. Dr. O'Donoghue's status and skills as a politician guided us through this extended process. Dr. O'Donoghue was my colleague and mentor, and we became close friends over these years. And she was a companion to many of us in our struggle for justice for First Nations people, a struggle which began, you could say, in 1788 and continues today. There's no doubt about that. Dr. O'Donoghue made an enormous contribution to that struggle. In doing so, she made an equally enormous contribution to the life of the nation. Dr. O'Donoghue had an extraordinary lifelong career of service. She played a leading role in many of the major political movements across her long lifetime. As you all know, she came from very humble beginnings and was, like all of us, subject to systemic racism. In her distinguished career, she was, rec she was recognised many times, and a few accolades are Australian of the Year in, 80, in 1984, the first Aboriginal person to address the United Nations General Assembly, Companion of the Order of Australia in 1999, and even a papal honour, being made a dame in the Order of St Gregory the Great in 2005. This was bestowed upon her by Pope John Paul II. How amazing is that? <laughs> First time I heard that I couldn't believe it. And all this and more, of course, is public history. But what it doesn't tell you is her, her importance to us, First Peoples of this country, as a leader, mentor and advocate. She never stopped campaigning for justice for us. She did this with, with characteristic toughness, humour and grace. I remember when we took the Commonwealth to court, the first jurisdiction to do so, for stolen generations, and uh, we were standing outside the court on the footpath in Darwin and uh, uh, all the silks and the barristers were going into court with those trolleys, you know, that you carry fridges on, it's piled high with folders like this thick and we're standing there looking at each other and thinking, oh my goodness. And anyhow, we're sort of feeling really apprehensive. And this car pulls up, you know, got the big red Z plates and we all looked at each other and said, oh goodness. Who's coming now? And out got Dr. O'Donoghue. <laughs> and she sort of came over and we all hugged her and everything. The sort of relief went out of the air even though we were outside and we thought, oh, thank goodness for that. She just turned up to be with us. Just as, you know, in those days, Darwin was quite small, you know, it wasn't, it was, <laughs> we're pretty parochial, but we didn't think, we never occurred to us that she would come 
and spend two days with us, and she did. There was no press conference. She just hung out with us. Everything she did was with characteristic toughness, honour and grace. I knew Dr O'Donnell by her work and her standing before I met her. She was at the forefront of national affairs when I was still running around Darwin wondering what to say and how to say it. Later, I saw her at work in meetings between senior Aboriginal leaders, federal cabinet ministers and ATSIC commissioners. She was a tough defender of the organisation that she chaired and someone whose et intellect and determination commanded respect always. Her leadership style was for formidable. She was no nonsense. Her work ethic was unmatched. And all she said, as the Prime Minister already said, because she loved us so. However, I can recall times when we were all quaking in our boots, and that includes cabinet ministers. It was during um, when uh, Mr Keating was the um, Prime Minister and we had a, a cabinet meeting, the senior cabinet, they were on one side of this huge table and we were on the other side of the table. And Dr O'Donoghue was, was really angry with us and she sort of stomped it through went and sat at the end of the table and sort of looked, glared down the table as all, including the cabinet ministers. And I think it was um, Mr. Crean leaned across the table to us and he says, I think you guys have got the floor. <laughs> but in the fierce policy and political battles that went with the job, she was remarkable in that she never held a grudge. She was always willing to build bridges she was always respectful of other people. I, like many of us, saw this combination of strength, grace and humour, admired it and tried, sometimes unsuccessfully, to learn from it. One of her other important achievements, often overlooked in the obituaries of Dr O'Donoghue, is the significant role she played in the flourishing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. This is particularly relevant to recall today, which of course is International Women's Day. There's a whole generation of First Nations women who flourished because of Dr O'Donoghue. First Nations women have contacted me over these last few weeks and telling me stories about catching a glimpse of Dr O'Donoghue in some hallway of power and being totally starstruck and inspired to follow in her footsteps. And despite her toughness, she was always a gracious person. Notwithstanding the extraordinary demands on her, she always found time to remember who our kids were, and in some cases now our grandkids, and ask after them, remembering their names and with genuine, genuine interest. I also want to mention her faith which I believe gave her joy and sustained her through some hard and dark times, of which there were many. She loved the symbolism and ritual of the church and the music. She so loved the music. She also loved singing. And of course, her love of Thai food is legendary. I will leave you with Dr. O'Donoghue's words from 1997 when she gave one of her many addresses to the National Press Club, talking of the need to, to give us, Australia's first peoples, a voice on all matters that affect our lives, she said in 1997, I quote, we cannot lose the will to resolve these issues because they will not go away, but tackling them half-heartedly or high-handedly will be a recipe for continuing failure. I believe that solutions are at hand but they will require determination and patient effort, negotiation and compromise, imagination and true generosity. I just want to emphasise those qualities again. Determination and patient effort, negotiation and the art, the art of principled, principled compromise. There is such a thing. Imagination, again, and true generosity. I cannot think of better words to describe her gift 
to all those who had the good fortune to know her and interact with her. These qualities shone through in everything she did with us and for us and for the nation, always, always. These qualities are why she was and always will be so loved and respected. Indeed, a grand, a truly grand woman. I now invite Mr. Paul Kelly to come forward and sing Brown Skin Baby. I've heard from the family that this is Auntie's favorite song, the Bob Randolph song. I first heard it about 40 years ago around a backyard campfire in Alice Springs and stayed with me ever since. Yeah. Yeah. him away As a young preacher I used to ride my pied pony around the countryside In a native camp I never forget the young black mother her cheeks all wet Yeah My brown skin baby They take him away Between her sobs I heard her say Police been taking My baby away To white man boss The baby I had Oh why he let them Take baby away Yeah, yeah, my brown skin baby, they take him away to a children's home. The baby came with new clothes on and a new name. Day and night, he would always say, Oh, mommy. Mommy, why they take me away? Yeah, yeah. My brown skin baby, they take him away. The child grew up, he had to go from that mission home. He loved so to find his mother. He tried in vain upon this earth. They never met again. Yeah, yeah. My brown skin baby, they take him away. skin baby they take him away my brown skin baby they take him I acknowledge the Kaurna people, traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, and all First Nations peoples present with us and who are joining us online today. 
On behalf of our family, I would like to welcome you all and sincerely thank you for gathering to honour and celebrate the life of our auntie, nana and sister, Loija O'Donoghue. I know for certain that she would think today is just perfect. This is exactly what she wanted. My name is Deborah Edwards. Many of you would know me as Deb, but my auntie only ever called me Deborah, and she would want me to address myself correctly on an occasion such as this, otherwise I would get into so much trouble. I am the daughter of Loage's sister Amy, who was two years older and with whom she shared a very close bond. It would be amiss of me on this International Women's Day to not, not acknowledge both of their incredible trailblazing achievements in South Australia. Loager as the first Aboriginal trainee nurse at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and my mother Amy, her big sister, the first Aboriginal primary school teacher in South Australia. Such incredible women from one family. The collective hearts of our family are filled with heartbreak and sadness that our beloved auntie and nana has returned home. Graciously, she chose her time well, a Sunday, and when it came, she was peaceful, comfortable, and surrounded by those of us who loved and adored her. Auntie Loager was always fiercely independent and strong-willed, as many of you would know. We knew that she would always go when she was good and ready, and most likely not without a fight. We almost lost her in the first week of November, when Auntie Loager reached end of life stage across a period of about seven to 10 days. But she soon decided, assisted by the power of prayer and song, that it was not yet her time. By December, she was up and about taking walks around her home at Helping Hand Aged Care in Golden Grove. On January the 8th, Auntie Loager broke her hip. She had surgery as a palliative measure, which went very smoothly. However, she was never able to fully recover, and she passed away on the morning of Sunday 4th, just in time for church. We knew our Auntie Loager to be a kind, generous, compassionate, and larger-than-life, one-of-a-kind woman. She was always immaculately dressed, never a hair out of place, zipping around Adelaide in her groovy Volkswagen, which was often parked on the front lawn of our family home. Inside the bonnet, there was always a picnic basket, packed full of everything you might need on a day out for a quick cuppa and a snack. Lower Joe O'Donoghue was always ready. Ready with a packed overnight bag for a hospital stay, ready with a needle and thread, ready with a mini laundry kit to wash her smalls out in the hotel room, and always ready to support and comfort people in need. Childhood memories for many of our family included visiting Auntie Loager at work at the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, her being front and centre of many gatherings of the Colebrook Home families, watching her run around a hockey field. You might not know that, she was quite a hockey player. Uh, which in turn inspired many of us to take up hockey, including myself. And of course, many trips to visit Auntie and her late husband, Gordon Smart, AKA Smarty, at their home at Corn in the Flinders Ranges. When Auntie Loage's career blossomed in National Aboriginal Affairs, it meant that she headed off to live in Canberra and traveled even further afield month after month and year after year. We missed her. We all had to adjust to not seeing her so frequently, and instead we watched on with great pride as she created pathways, took charge of board meetings, negotiated history, making events, received awards of the highest order, and she handled it all with determination, a cool head, grace, dignity, and compassion. We knew that she was independent, however, we still would have loved to have her close by and family was always so important. I have found a guest book within Artie's collection at the National Library in Canberra from when she featured on the TV program, This Is Your Life. It contains a handwritten message from our mum, Amy, which says, we as a family loaned you to the Commonwealth for many years, but we are glad you have decided to come back 
to Adelaide to live now. Hope this means we will see you more often. I am proud of you and your achievements. This is the end, no more secrets. Way to go, Mum, sorting out your little sister and speaking the truth. Many of us will know that Auntie was very direct and often also with a great sense of humour. A few years ago when I dyed my hair dark red, she looked at me and said, is it staying like that? To which I said, yes, and she said, well, I don't like it. Last year I went away to visit, sorry, last year I went to visit her after a few weeks away and she said, and where have you been? Off doing Lower Jer O'Donoghue business, I suppose. And then there was the poor orderly at her post-surgery hospital stay in January who really copped it and dared to give her one back. Auntie may have called him a naughty word for not being very uh, gentle with her, in her opinion, and he replied with, well, I've never been called that by anyone with their own Wikipedia page before, <laughs> so I'm going to let that one slide. We loved her, we adored her. We have no idea what life will be like without her here. We are so proud of all that she was, all that she achieved, and all that she gave to this nation. We are proud that she was ours. For my cousin Amy and I, the privilege and honor of caring for our auntie during the past 10 years was a gift that she gave to us. For the past four years at Helping Hand, she was safe and loved and had the best of care for which we are eternally grateful. And I would like to thank all of the wonderful staff from Helping Hand who are here with us today because you mean so much to us. Auntie Lowage's legacy lives on through the Lowage O'Donoghue Foundation, which was established with her blessing on her 90th birthday in 2022. She approved the OWL logo created by her great niece, Bianca, she nodded with great appreciation at the news that an Aboriginal South Australian woman had been awarded the inaugural nursing scholarship bearing her name. Creating a foundation in her name was an act of love that we gave to her. She asked me to continue her legacy and I have promised her that I would. We all know that she would say that the work must go on and she would also say, stand up and be counted. So that's what we all must do. I have never left my auntie without telling her that I love her. It was always very important for her to hear it, and I'm sure a lot of you understand why. And I do love you, auntie. We all do so very much, and we will see you again someday. And I welcome the weary choir who will sing High Old Gladling Light.
a reading from a reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favourable or unfavourable. Convince, rebuke and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. But having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Hear the word of the Lord.
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would have I told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hear the word of the Lord. Nyuntu walka palyaju juta palyunyu. I ring a new rule. Anangu munu Aboriginal jutaku. Kuari pulampanyari nyutulpa walcha jujanka. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. This gospel reading has several implications. In the context of a funeral, it reminds us of the preparation of our heavenly dwelling places. Jesus says, in my Father's house, there'll be many rooms. In some of the older versions of the Bible, it says there will be many mansions. But there will be a unity under one roof. A place for each of us. A unique room for each of us. Something special for each one of us. We are not all the same. We are different. We are created unique. Yet in this vision of Jesus, there is an enormous accommodating space, room for all of us. We may describe it as one for many, or perhaps a unity in diversity. The Father's house with space for all his children. Irrespective of race, Colour and creed. A space for all his children. Uniqueness. Who we are and who God created us to be. This uniqueness is to be celebrated. 
We are given our personalities, our gifts, and our abilities. And we offer them up for the service of others. A gift to the community and for the building up of the community. But not all the same. And neither should we be. We are the one and the many. But a unity in diversity. Luigi was certainly unique. She was her own person, but wonderfully gifted with great abilities. A remarkable woman, a leader of many, but also a servant of many. Not only the First Nations communities, but I would suggest to all Australians, she longed for a unity, but in diversity, acknowledging the sameness, but the difference. Luicia offered powerful leadership to many, an example to us all. She served her community and Australia by not necessarily saying what others wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. And Luicia did that well with passion and with grace. At the heart of Luigi's life was her Christian faith. Luigi was always strong in her faith. From years of Bible study which continued on through every decade of her life. Right up to her death, she held no fear. Her faith carried and supported her throughout her entire life. Luigi was raised in the Baptist tradition and she attended West Care Baptist Church here in Adelaide and also came here in the evening to St Peter's Cathedral. She told me that she liked the old hymns. Luicia recognised, of course, the injustice of being removed from her mother and family, and also that the role that the church played in this. Yet she found embedded in the Christian faith the strength to live a Christian life while not being afraid to speak the truth. Luigi was able to reconnect with her mother and family, but also to witness the consequences when families are forcibly separated. This affected her deeply but it formed part of her drive to make life better for other people.
Luita's faith gave her strength. She continued to rise and succeed despite every challenge and obstacle. Often she was disarmed by prejudice and discrimination, but she continued on. She continued to create pathways through sheer determination tempered by grace, empathy and kindness. The work of First Nations justice that so occupied Luigi's life remains with us. The job is not done. Luigi's legacy calls each one of us to continue to work for justice for First Nations peoples, which, as she believed, will only create a better Australia for all people, a fair and just Australia. Back to the Gospel. The vision of Jesus is not just about what waits for us in the future. It also has to do with the present. A room for all in the Father's house. A room for each one of us. The unity found in diversity, a space for uniqueness, a room for all. In the name of God, creator, redeemer and sanctifier, As we come to this time of prayer, may I invite you in a few moments of silence to hold in your mind and in your hearts some special memory of Loacher. Thanks be to God for the gift of life. Father, you have made us in your image and called us to reflect your truth and light. We thank you for Loacher's life, for her love of family and of friends, and the joy she found in their company, for the help and support that she gave to so many, and for her devoted service to the Australian community. Above all, we thank you for your gracious promise to all your servants living and departed, that we shall be made one again in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Support us all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes. The busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over. And our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and a peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. God of all mercy, giver of all comfort, look graciously, we pray, on those who mourn, casting all their cares on you. May they know the consolation of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Please remain standing. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave new birth to our sister Loicha by water and the Spirit. Grant that her death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way, to live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit through the ages of ages. Amen. Let us entrust our sister to the mercy of God and say together, Holy and loving Father, by your mighty power you gave us life. And in your love you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust the reacher to your merciful keeping and the faith of Jesus Christ. We pray and praise the name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. In your keeping are all who have departed in Christ. We here commit the body of our dear sister, Loicha, to be cremated, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again for us, and who shall change our mortal body, that it may be like his glorious body. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, in his infinite love and mercy, Bring the whole church, living and departed in the Lord Jesus, to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of his kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Thank you. 